It has been just one week since Sajid Javid took over the job of health secretary after his predecessor, Matt Hancock, was caught on CCTV doing a big old smooch. And even in that short period of time, Javid has already made it clear that he'll have a very different attitude to managing the pandemic. In a departure from Hancock's mantra of data, not dates, Javid has said that he considers July the 19th a hard deadline for ending the coronavirus restrictions. Writing in the Mail on Sunday, Javid said, we are on track for July 19th and we have to be honest with people about the fact we cannot eliminate COVID. We also need to be clear that cases are going to rise significantly. I know many people will be cautious about the easing of restrictions. That's completely understandable. But no date we choose will ever come without risk. So we have to take a broad and balanced view. We are going to have to learn to accept the existence of COVID and find ways to cope with it, just as we already do with the flu. So Javid is looking at where we are now with infections up 66.9% on the previous seven days, hospitalizations up 24.2% and says that that is a reasonable risk when compared to the burden of continuing restrictions. And bear in mind, absolutely everybody, Chris Whitty, Patrick Valance thinks that in the next few weeks, infections are going to increase even further. So Dahlia, one of the things that Javid argues in this piece is that there is a healthcare case for ending coronavirus restrictions. So there is a backlog of elective procedures. People's mental health is worsening. Rates of domestic violence are going up. Do you have much sympathy with this argument? I mean, I have huge amounts of sympathy for the argument because obviously lockdowns are horrible, right? Like, and and it's, it's true that there's a backlog of elective procedures, that there's a mental health crisis. But scrapping masks and scrapping all these restrictions and you know preventative infrastructures like contact tracing like even when there's a clear risk that the the infection is still so high it's possibly the most counterproductive way that you can actually deal with it because it's precisely those sort of small but sustainable over the long term changes like mask wearing etc and you know providing furlough to isolate as well you know i think those measures are kind of sometimes missing from the conversation That's what prevents us from having to go into these very extreme lockdowns for such a long period of time. So if you what you actually cared about was, you know, preventing the harmful effects of very, you know, restrictive lockdowns, then firstly, you know, you wouldn't sort of batter the possibility of mental health provision and, you know, safe shelters for violence victims through years of austerity. But you would also, in the more immediate term, support those kind of everyday, long-term sustainable restrictions. That means we don't have to let things get so bad that, you know, we have no choice but to enter into the most restrictive lockdowns. And that's kind of been the character of how the UK has responded to the pandemic. And it's why we're gonna have so many knock-on effects in this way. So I think that this is really Javid covering up for his real motive here, which is sort of saving, you know, the economic interests of big business in, you know, especially in the hospitality and the service sector, which kind of makes up a huge part of the UK economy with sort of quite a disingenuous concern for what are actually real issues, because those issues are not things that Tories seem particularly concerned about um, in any other context. But I think also, you know, what disturbs me so much about this is how, you know, learning to live with the virus, which is a sensible and important policy is being weaponized in such a misleading and anti-science way because of course we need to learn to live with the virus like it's a really resilient virus and you know no one believes that constantly locking down um, is sort of a sustainable or desirable way to live you know no one wants that but Living with the virus cannot mean just going back to 2019 or sort of being deluded that we're living without it. It has to be sort of adapting our, you know, social expectations, our norms, you know, things like checking in on um, contact tracing before you go into a restaurant, things like wearing masks on public transport, you know, these kind of low effort, low inconvenience, but incredibly high return on safety measures. That, you know, there is no reason why, as I mentioned before, like wearing masks on public transport shouldn't be a long term thing. Um, 
And yet these are the measures that we are, that the government are scrapping for those, as I mentioned before, those sort of cheap optics of, you know, being able to announce Freedom Day, even though ironically, it's these policies that mean that we're going to be much more likely to have to go into restrictive lockdowns again. Um, but I also think, you know, and I'm going to end it here, kind of the, the, the crucial thing to note here is, you know, the data shows that, you know, hospitalizations are low that you know and that's obviously great but the long-term adverse effects of catching coronavirus can't only be measured by hospitalizations you know i know many people personally who were never hospitalized from covid but they are still suffering from the long-term effects of long covid for coming up to nine months and that's the data that is routinely forgotten even though it actually represents the experiences of a lot of people especially people who are working in those hospitality industries working in those industries that are at really high risk of um, covid and who aren't double vaccinated yet um, and that is partly because you know society doesn't know how to reckon with or accommodate for things like chronic illness. We think about sickness as something that you just sort of, you get sick and then you get cured and it's all fine. So simply saying, well, you know, hospitalizations are low, so it's all good. It's deliberately excluding a huge part um, of the story of COVID, basically. Do you think that Javid's previous role as chancellor is relevant to the story because it means that he's not simply making the case for health in cabinet meetings. We've essentially got two Sunaks making the same arguments for unlocking faster in order to stimulate the economy. Oh, a hundred percent. But I think it's so important that we cut through that to say, because when people hear, oh, you know, Sajid Javid's priority is the economy. That sounds super benevolent. We all benefit, you know, this idea is we all benefit from, you know, a good economy and that, you know, that's just as important to our health as, you know, these other kind of public health measures. But we have to remember that in Sunak and Javid's books, the economy is about protecting the interests and the profits of a tiny group of business owners and, you know, business elites. It's not actually about, you know, stimulating the economic benefit and the economic welfare of the country as a whole. And that is encapsulated by the fact that as part of the scrapping of these measures, we are going to see a rollback on furlough, which is an essential economic measure to help everyday working class people take, you know, protect themselves. And also, you know, to make sure that they aren't really severely financially hit by having to self-isolate. So it is true, yes, that this idea of prioritizing the economy is part of that the, the kind of agenda, but we mustn't mistake prioritizing the economy with looking after the economic well-being of everyday people. It means something really, really specific. 